Um, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our Cozy Craft Along mini series. My name is Leah. I am your moderator today. And Craftsy, the National Quilter Circle, National Sewing Circle, and our Creative Crochet Corner have all teamed up to provide a full week of live demonstrations and a bundle of five free winter-themed patterns. Make sure to download your free patterns by clicking the link in the description. And once you get to the patterns page, click the picture of the project it is that you would like to download. Once you enter your email, you will receive your free download right away. Now each day this week, a new instructor is streaming live as we quilt, sew, crochet, and bake. And you will get those step-by-step -step demonstration of all of these festive winter projects. Now, if you have any questions during the event, please leave your comments in the blue chat box below or in the chat on Facebook and YouTube, and I will keep an eye on the comments during the event. Of course, if there's anything that is specific to the project, I jump those in when they come in, when there's a break in the project so we can talk about it live. Any general questions you have, feel free to share those as well. We usually have time at the end for a couple fun questions that might not have been so project specific. Now, thank you for bearing with us. Uh, we had that little bit of technical difficulty before we got started, but Colleen is ready to go and I'm ready to introduce her. So Colleen Tauke is with us today. Thank you so much for being here. I would love for you to tell us a little bit about you and then also the project that we're digging into today. Okay. I'm a quilter slash sewist by nature. I've been doing sewing and projects probably about since I was in kindergarten. I don't think my mom could get me out of the sewing room when I was really little. And then along the way, I just kept picking up fun skills, love to see small projects, big projects, got into quilting. And after that, it was just like the sky's the limit. So you can incorporate your sewing and your quilting and make all kinds of really fun projects. So as a mom of four and a grandmother of six, it's always a lot of moving parts around here. So when I got asked to make a project or come up with an idea for the little craft along here we have. Um, I was inspired because I like to spend time in the kitchen with my grandkids and they love to sit on the counter or be on a step stool and have that stirring spoon and of course we're always in the need for a towel. I don't know why because there's there's always little messes that happen along the way. So my idea was to come up with that little towel that you can grab for that little messes um, when you're in the kitchen. So that was my idea and a little bit of, of the background of why I went that direction. <laughs> oh. Well, so you're going to be able to see that pattern. So make sure you click on today's Christmas cheer for all the information that you're going to need to follow along today. <laughs> well, Colleen, we do have some people loving the quilt that's behind you. Um, and uh, we've got some comments dropping in. I know some people, again, uh, thank you so much for bearing with us. Uh, I know we're having, we're, we're suspecting maybe I, a couple of you have mentioned how cold it is where you are. It's cold where we are too. And maybe that was messing with the technology a bit, but I think we're going to get ready to go. We've got people watching, uh, keep your questions coming into the chat box, but I'm going to let Colleen dig right in and get started with today's project. Okay. Like I said, make sure you download that pattern because there are a couple of templates in there you're going to need in order to create the shapes for the towel that fits over either a cabinet uh, handle or the door on your refrigerator or on your oven, someplace where you can hang that little uh, looped over Santa's hat. That's why I kind of feel like it's cold outside today and I needed to dress a little like maybe Mrs. Claus today <laughs> in the Midwest. So this is what we're gonna create today. It uses a half of a towel as the a hand, a kitchen towel as the base at the bottom. And then we're gonna create Santa's little locked over hat here with a button closure and the hat band. I'm going to hold it up to the camera so you can see the hat band is actually pieced. Now, if you aren't crazy about working with small pieces, you could possibly cheat and use another piece of fabric as a solid. But little piecing like that kind of gives you a little taste of working with miniatures is something you might not have done before. So this is a small project. So if maybe miniatures aren't your thing, maybe you at least find out, I like this or I don't like this in this project. So in the... Oh, I mean, yes, I'm sure. So sorry. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Um, I believe we are going to give your camera a quick reset because it's not focusing quite 
where people can see it. So we're going to take a little pause. Okay. Everybody watching, stay on the link. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and say it looks like we might be back up here, Colleen. So just a quick welcome back to everybody that is hanging with us. Thank you so much. Uh, I do believe that we've got everything up and running. I am going to let Colleen complete the project. Don't worry if you have to hop out early. Remember, you can always come back and watch this another time. So Colleen, let's go with take two. <laughs> Get us started. <laughs> Here we go. We are working on Christmas cheer. We're making a little towel for the kitchen with a Santa hat that just kind of loops over your handle buttons, or there's another option if you're not into making a button hole. But our project, make sure that you go in and download that pattern so that you can get all the materials and the templates that you need to complete this project. So here are the um, basics of what you need to have some kind of a fabric for your Santa hat, whether it has um, is a tone on tone or a dot or a, a, uh, a plaid, something that kind of reads as a Santa hat for the main portion of your towel top, um, your little towel. Then a selection of cream on creams or white on whites. Um, I had some leftover from a project, so I have a variety. And from the camera, I know you're probably not picking up. They are a white on cream. So they are all really small scale because this is pieced in really small squares. So we want something fairly small in scale of design so that it reads kind of as one piece. But we're going to do a little bit of practicing of small pieces in this project. Um, and I wrote scraps. You could go through, you've got leftovers from backgrounds from all kinds of projects if you're a quilter like I am. So more than likely you have pieces that you can use for that. Then you need a piece of fabric that you can use as the back side. Let me pull my pieces over here real quick. We're going to face this with a fabric on the back. The band itself is a standalone piece. So you need a piece of fabric that you can use as a backing for that. Then you need um, one kitchen towel. I actually, when I went shopping for these, I found them in a bundle so I could have extra um, towels for my kitchen. Sorry, I picked up a piece of hair here. There we go. There are stripes, there are um, checks and plaids and solids. So um, I could resist because I think I'm going to make some more of these. So there, once you get going and get the first one over with, then the learning curve gets a little sharper. So you can create um, a variety of different kinds of towels. And think of that non-traditional kind of Christmas fabric too that you can use. So maybe bright turquoise is what you're using in your kitchen. So why not go that direction? And then you're going to need a piece of batting, which is going to be inside of just the hat portion. So that 14 by 14 inch square, there are layers inside of this just to kind of give it some lift. So it has some shape to it. And then you're going to need some, a couple, or at least one, if you're making one towel, these are a one and a quarter inch um, large button to put on the little flip over of the top, kind of like the pom-pom on Santa's hat. So you'll need those. The basic um, sewing supplies looks like kind of a long list, but most of these things you probably have in your sewing center. A uh, basting spray is an option. I will tell you though, you could probably get away without using it. I did this morning. So shh. No quilt police. I didn't use it, but if if you have slide your fabric to batting in the later step, you may want to use a little basting spray. Um, a glue fab a fabric glue stick, which I failed to pull out ahead of time. This happens to be a Fonzer and Porter one, but Soline makes one. I think Quilter Select makes these. Um, you can use a normal glue stick that's kind of the kids kindergarten glue stick, but it has kind of a, a large barrel and this is smaller. And so you can be more exact about where you put your glue. Of course, your rotary cutter, um, a ruler, the six by 12 would be big enough for what project we're working on here, your cutting mat, a uh, fabric marking pen, something that you can see against um, your red fabric or on the backside of your red fabric. So um, either a bright color or a dark, there are so many different kinds of marking pens out there. It's really gonna depend if you're marking on this dark red versus this light turquoise or what you're going to need. So you select the one that works best on that background fabric. Um, of course, then um, thread, pins, scissors, seam ripper, always at the ready, just in case. 
a hand sewing needle and that's only to put the button on. I'm not gonna make you do a bunch of hand sewing today. Uh, a fusible interfacing and you just need a little piece and I'll show you where we're gonna hide that later. Some template plastic. If you decide that you really want to make a, a large number of these, the two pieces that are here as your shapes, you are going to be downloading those and printing those onto paper. Those are hard to trace around. So if you um, transfer those to either a cardstock or to template plastic, then they have a little bit more longer life and it's easier to trace around the outside edge that's a little more rigid. And if you wanted to fussy cut or something, line something up, the template plastic lets you see through to line that up. And then a permanent marking pen, that's the one thing that makes sure you only use this on the template plastic, but that way when you're tracing around and cutting that, you don't transfer lead or anything onto your scissors and mess up the, the blade of your scissors. So a Sharpie works good for tracing things onto template plastic. A turning tool, and let's see, I have um, a couple of different ones in my drawer here. Let's see if I can find my favorite one, not offhand. You know what, end up using a lot though as a turning tool, a pencil. <laughs> so growing up when I was a sewer and we were turning collars and we were turning cuffs and to get that point, we didn't usually have a turning tool. So my mom's favorite tool was the tip of a pencil. And actually a blunted pencil is actually better because then it eases the point out and doesn't blow through that stitching in the corner. But something you can shape with. Maybe it might even be your finger, depending on, on how it goes today. I'll show you. And then an option for that button might be a hook and loop tape if you don't like making buttonholes. Remember I said, some people don't like making buttonholes and hook and loop tape can be your friend to hide underneath. And then it easily can be a closure um, for the um, top of the towel also. So we are going to get started in the construction do we have any questions or anything out there, Leah, that we need to address? We do not yet, but just okay. a reminder, if you did join us at the beginning, we had a little technical difficulty. Any questions that you have for Colleen during the project, go ahead and drop them into the chat box and I'll get, the, get to those when she has a little pause point so we can talk about them while the project is going on. Save your general questions for the end and we'll get to some of those when we finish up. All right, Colleen, you can go with step one. Okay, here we go. The first thing that we're going to be creating is the actual um, top of our towel. So it's a little Santa. It almost looks like a gnome hat, but we're calling it a Santa hat here. You're going to trace the shape onto either the cardstock or the template plastic. You're going to lay that onto your fabric, trace around that shape and cut it out on the line. Now, remember on the template, it says cut one and cut one in reverse very important because at some point we want these to back each other and if you do it the wrong way you're going to end up with points that don't match up so remember one the correct direction and one in reverse so that's why it's really important to always transfer the instructions to your template or to your cardboard shape so once you have those two cut out then put it on to batting and that's where i said that if you don't want to use basting spray, you might be able to get away without it. Because today, while I was preparing my pieces, there's enough, because these pieces are so small and batting kind of has a, a grippiness to it anyway. It's, it has a kind of a texture to it. My fabric really just gripped right down to the batting. So I didn't actually use the basting spray. But if your batting has any polyester in it or happens to be a wool batting or something, it may be a little shinier. It may need that basting spray to hold it in place. Now you can see that the batting I've cut larger here just because it's easier to maneuver under the machine when you want to go in to do some machine quilting. And as I pick these up, you'll notice I've machine quilted the backs. You can see through. This one I did with wavy lines. This one I did it with straight lines. You can do whatever kind of quilting on it you like. In fact, if you didn't want to quilt it at all, you probably could get by without quilting because of the size and the button is gonna hold to the center, you may be able to bypass the quilting altogether, but this is the perfect opportunity to do a little bit of machine quilting that maybe you haven't gotten into yet. Maybe you are a little bit shy about doing that free motion lines, that wavy lines. So here's a good place to practice it. Sometimes in small bites is a good thing, or you can always just do um, very similar 
straight line quilting on there. I actually didn't even mark these. I just used the foot of my machine and guided it through. Close counts. It's in the kitchen. It's going to be a towel. It's not something that's ever going to get reviewed that closely. Once you have this all machine quilted, go back and trim the batting right up to the edge of the fabric because we're going to be joining these two pieces together very shortly. And we need that outer edge so we can keep a quarter inch seam allowance as we join them. Uh, one thing I did not mention was the placement of that batting. And I'm gonna hold this up and you're gonna see that the fabric extends beyond the edge of that batting. In your notes, it tells you to leave about a half an inch difference between the, the edge of the fabric itself and the batting as you go in to do your quilting. And I'll show you in a minute why we do that. I tried the first one in my prototype to extend the batting all the way to the bottom. I'm a quilter, it'll be fine. And then when I tried to turn the edge, it was so bulky that my machine didn't like me very well. So devising a way to make it go together more smoothly, I backed that batting up so that we can then turn the fabric edge, this fabric that extended toward the batting and press that down along that edge. So our iron's hot here. I don't know if you can catch me in the camera here. We'll move over just a little bit. And we're going to press this edge under and it's about half an inch approximately. So remember I said close counts. It's kind of like horseshoes in, in Santa's village here. Half an inch or so, press that under. And at this point, if that fabric doesn't want to lay down and, and behave nicely for you, just a little bit of glue stick will hold him in place perfectly while we're sewing here. I always kind of look for ways to get away from using pins. So why not use glue stick? It's washable. <laughs> okay, now we're gonna put right sides together and we're going to sew with those turn down edges in place so that it'll be finished along that edge when we complete it. Now you also want to make a reinforced stitch as you start. In quilting, that's usually something that we don't do very often, but because it's gonna take a little bit more tug in that area, we wanna reinforce the beginning and the end of our seam. So we're coming to go around this with a quarter inch seam real quickly. When you get to the curve part, there's where you have to slow down a little bit because that curve is gonna be really noticeable near the button. And so you want that to be a nice curve. So just go slowly around the curve. Kind of reminds me when we were first learning to drive a car, when we would get to a curve and we'd all kind of freak out just a little bit. And our parents would say, slow down, <laughs> put your foot on the brake. Well, just go slowly around that part. And then you can come back to that straight away kind of shaped like a C slope and finish out that seam. And again, remember I said reinforce stitch at the other end so that it won't pull out. Okay, out of the machine, trim any loose threads. Smaller scissors sometimes work best for that. Now, at this point, you need to go in and trim these curves and clip so that you get a nice edge to turn. Clipping is something that quilters aren't really mm, familiar with. I think it's more of a garment sewing thing when it comes to inside and outside curves. On most quilting things, we don't do much clipping for turning, maybe in turn needle applique, but take your time and clip about every half inch or so around this edge and then the other thing that I did is I went in and I trimmed my batting, just the batting layer. So just use the tip of your scissors to get in there and trim away that excess batting, especially on the curves if you can, because that will give you that nicer rounded point or a tip on this hat. So I'm gonna quickly just get that portion clipped a little bit so that we can turn him right side out 
and get on to the next portion of our hat making here. Okay, trim just around that curve. So that's a lot of fabric and a lot of thickness if we leave all of that in the top of the hat. So I would do a little bit more trimming than I have done here, but for time purposes, let's see if we can get this turned. And that's where that turning tool can come in. Or if you have long skinny fingers that you can get up into that hat and kind of push out that curve nicely. Didn't turn out too bad considering. Okay, and then come in and kind of push that seam out all the way along and give it a nice little press. A hot iron does wonders for curves. Smooth that all out perfectly. Now we have the top portion assembled. We need to move on to getting that towel portion ready to go. So let's move our tools out of the way. Now I have the other half of this towel ready to go. So all I did was take a towel and fold it in half, find the center, cut down through the middle. But as you cut through the center of a towel, and remember this is, you know, the Terry towel is kind of loopy and it can shed a little before you do much movement on it, gently take it to the sewing machine and zigzag stitch that outer, that cut edge. Or if you have a serger, take it to the serger and do a nice clean finish on that edge so it doesn't fray. When things are washed, they sometimes take a lot of stress and the terry towel can start to disintegrate if it's not stabilized and um, encased that way. Now, what we need to do with this, I kind of double checked the hem on the towel. So that would be on the back side. So I have the right side up and I need to reduce this to about seven inches. So in order to do that, you can do a folding. You could do a gather line if you're a, fancy sewer and you wanted to just gather this all in, you could do a gathering stitch. What I simply did was to find the center and I would have given you all dimensions, but then I realized that some hand towel, kitchen towels are different sizes. So <laughs> I had to let you know that you just need to get this down to seven inches so that it will fit this guy. So what we need to do is to do a fold to bring it in and I've got a ruler in front of me so I can see where seven inches is. So I know center of seven is three and a half. So I need to fold this in a couple of folds in order to get it half of it there. That looks about right. And like I said, everybody's gonna be looking at the top part of this. They're not gonna look at the folds that closely. So then I need to fold in the other side, a couple of tucks to get it, the whole entire thing, to be seven inches. And actually the first time I folded it, it took me a while. <laughs> After that, it came pretty common then. So we have it reduced to about seven inches there. So then I take it through the sewing machine and I am going to do a stitch close to that cut edge. And it's gonna be kind of a long stitch. So I'm gonna set my machine at about a 3.5 length stitch. So I'm just holding this in place until we get to apply it to the, oh, a second. I wanna move my needle position so I can see where I'm at here a little better. And then hit my stitch length. It's so cold in my sewing space that it's not even recognizing my poor little fingers today. We need hot chocolate, I think, Leah, to keep us all warm. <laughs> it is the season. Yes, it is. Most definitely. Well, last week in, in the Midwest, we had almost 60 degrees. Um, not so much today. <laughs> okay, I need to adjust that just a bit. And we're going to sew across that. I'm sewing about half an inch or so from that cut edge. You can stay within a half inch, quarter inch, somewhere in there. It just holds the layers so that when you go to put it into the so now we've got it kind of shrunk up a little pleated there we are going to put this inside of the santa hat and handy dandy glue stick to the rescue because trying to get this under the machine and held in place is a little tricky 
with thicker layers. I'm gonna tuck this in and just give that a little bit of tackiness so that it doesn't shift as I move it back to the sewing machine here. And the top layer, I'm gonna do the same thing. Just a little bit. All the things I never got to use in kindergarten because I'm too old. <laughs> okay, now I have tucked that up in there close to about half inch where I did that um, kind of stay stitch or holding it together stitch so that now I can put it into the machine and I would use matching thread, but I'm not gonna change threads right now. And then you'll be able to see where I'm really sewing at. This is gonna hold the entire thing together. And I'm gonna leave that at a bit longer um, stitch at three to three and a half. I don't know if I noted that in my instructions, but um, a little bit longer stitch here will be fine to hold it because we're going through a lot of thicknesses. So, and I am stitching about a quarter inch or so from the fold of my little hat portion, the top portion. And as I make it across, I am going to stop at the corner and pivot. I'm gonna put my needle in the needle down position. Then I'm gonna pick up my entire project here and I'm gonna shift and I'm going to top stitch all the way around the hat portion. That gives that outer edge kind of a nice clean finish. And it lays nicer, I think, because you've got a bulky seam there. A little top stitch just gives it kind of a, a nice finish. Again, when you get to that curve, what do we do? We have to slow down and I'm stitching in white. So this is gonna be interesting. Okay, really slow as we get to the top. I'm gonna to adjust really just every other, every other stitch or so, so I can get a nice curve. Kind of reminds me of doing blanket stitch on a, an applique. You want your curve to look so nice because you work so hard on it that a little bit of time is a good thing here. Okay. And then down this side. I like straightaways because I like to stitch fast. And I actually stitch better when I'm going fast. <laughs> okay. So we've got that. The top stitch portion is done. And it's been caught on the backside. It may not be perfect, but remember, it's only gonna be up for a few, few weeks during Christmas and they shouldn't be looking at the backside. <laughs> so, and with matching thread, you'll never notice that. So we've got that portion ready to go. So we'll set that aside. And now we need to get to our piecing. If you look in the instructions, I have you cut one and a quarter inch squares. And there are quilters out there right now who are gasping, who are saying, what? <laughs> I'm gonna work with teeny little postage stamps. Well, it's kind of fun just to put on some Christmas music and do some mindless sewing. So at this point, I was just chaining together and I have a variety. I think I have like eight different prints here because I've used white on white, cream on white for a lot of projects. So I just chained together five of these different prints. Then I picked up more. And to tell you the truth, I did them in twos first. So I set tick two, put them together, right sides together. If you're like me, you might need extra light to make sure that you have the white on cream, right sides together. My foot feet got away from me there. Okay, quarter inch seam. And I chain pieced a whole bunch of these because you can get twos, it's really easy just to, it's kind of like picking up little pieces of candy after a while and just send two by two we're not doing Noah's Ark here, but two by two through the machine. And after I got a long strand of them going, then I took them out of the machine and I clipped them apart. And of course, if we've got twosies and we add twosies together, we get four. So that means we're getting close to having our little pieces because we need five. So I'm gonna clip this five squares together in a line for each of the rows. So we need 45 pieces total of these little guys. So finger press just lightly here so that I could then add two of these together. When I joined those, then of course I went back on all these that were just 
a group of four, and they added a fifth square to it. And I have a bunch of those already prepared. Now, see, you can tell I've been sewing a whole bunch of these little guys ready to go. Let's see, wait, I had them stacked in an order. So uh, one got flipped over. Okay, here we go. We have nine of these short rows to create the band for our Santa hat. Now, when it comes to putting this many pieces together, we're gonna want uh, um, opposing seams, which means that we'll have seam allowance that will butt up against each other. We won't have to pin and we can send it through the machine really quickly. So once we get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, once we get them all laid out, we have to look at this really quick because we need to have them offset. So in the instructions, it will show you how to offset these rows so that you have a little piece sticking out each row. Instead of making them square, they're set on point. So we have kind of diamond shapes in our hat band like this. So they're offset. Whoops, this one's not offset. I almost messed up. There we go. Have to keep my, even myself honest here to make sure there's always a stair step on the outer edge like this. And then to go back and double check to see if my seam allowances need to be flipped in a different direction. We could plan ahead and press them perfectly. It would take a little bit of time, but if they happen to be going the wrong direction, it's just called corrective pressing. You just go in with the iron and you flip them all the other direction. The iron's the boss. You can always change directions of the pressing. So in this row, the seam allowances are coming toward me. In the second row, the seam allowances are going up. In this one, I happen to have them the other direction, but I, you know what, I can always flip it over if I like the alignment of my fabric side by side. So up, whoops, no, this one has to be down. I did have it right. This one has to be going up. And you can tell by sliding your finger across the fabric if you've got your seam allowances going that direction. So this is going up. This one needs to go back down the other direction. And we're gonna be joining those, all those nine rows together. What I'm trying to create, I'll show you really quick, is those opposing seams so that the seam allowances in this one are all swimming to the left. The seam allowances in this are all swimming to the right. And as I stitch, they will lock down nicely and give me a perfect join in my blocks. Because they're all white on white or cream on cream, a little tiny variation is not going to be a problem. So I've got them all joined together here. I've pressed all the seam allowances one direction as I was pressing these rows. So they're all going to the right here. Once you have those nine, I gave this a quick press with some best press. So a little bit of spray starch or sizing is your friend and it gives you a nice flat product. Now, the next step is to come in with your template and lay that on here and trace around it with your fabric marking tool. Now I'm using a bright orange. This is a, um, a marking that comes off with heat. So when an iron gets close to it, it disappears. This is going to be in the seam allowance. It won't make any difference. Um, I probably wouldn't use pencil lead or anything too dark here, just in case. There's always that time when we picked up the wrong tool, but fabric marking tools always are our friend in this case. So I trace that out. I'm going to cut that shape out. And some will say, well, just leave it. But there's kind of a reasoning behind um, cutting it out as we apply the backing fabric. So just going to trim, we're just taking off some of the points in some areas. Give that curve, this is gonna be our outer edge. Trying to line up two small pieces when one is pieced and one is a solid fabric can be a bit of a challenge. And I didn't want it to shift out of place. So the reasoning behind what I did was to trim this one and I will use this as my guide for my quarter inch seam. And my solid piece of fabric is going to be the facing or the back side of my hat band. So 
I am putting right side, the, the pretty side towards the fabric. So I have all the seam allowances up. Because there's so many seam allowances here, I wanna be able to make sure that they lay flat and stay manipulated. So I put that piece up so that I know for sure everybody's being good. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna set our machine for a quarter inch seam allowance and stitch our way around the hat band. When I was working on this, I even thought, well, I could do this even opening and turn the hat band. And then as I was stitching it, I thought, no, you're not going to, because all of those thick seam allowances, how are you ever gonna get a nice clean edge as you turn that? So there's another trick we're gonna do. Again, when you get to those curves, slow down, make a nice pretty curve, because that's gonna be the outer edge of the hat band. So slow and steady around that little curved edge. If you really don't like curved edges, you could make it squared. <laughs> That's a design option you could decide for yourself. Straight edge here. I don't know why I didn't think of that, but I, cut, I guess I liked the curved shape of the hat bands. So that's what I chose as my template. Okay, we get all the way around. Overlap your stitching by half an inch or so. That makes it secure. And I'm going to trim this extra fabric of the hat band, that backing facing fabric. I'm gonna trim that all off. And I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna clip my curves on the outer edge here in just a minute. Any questions out there, anything yet? Oh, we do have a few questions. Uh, we'll go back to some of the supply questions when we get to the end of the project. But Sarah did want to know about the hat, the top of the hat pieces. Do both of those need the batting, Colleen? I added them because I like the, the even weight of the front and the back having that batting layer because one is going to fold over to the front. And so if you've put batting behind this side and then not on this, you may not get the same appearance of that fluff feel to it. So that's why I added batting. And I had thought about that when I was working on it. And then when I thought, well, if I'm gonna fold it over, I want it to look the same on both sides. So that's why I added the batting on both of them. All those batting scraps we have anyway, we never know what to use them for. So this is the perfect place to go into that bin pull out those small pieces. Now I've clipped around my curves. What I'm going to do, and don't everybody gasp, but I'm pulling the facing fabric up and I'm gonna make a snip into it. Just that layer, make sure you just have that backing fabric. I'm going to make a slot for turning this right side out. So we can put my finger into one end and work the hat band out and through that slot. This is similar to an applique style that you use in interfacing on the back, but because interfacing isn't as stable, I didn't think that that would be enough to face the hat band. So I used a piece of cotton instead. And this is where I'm gonna use the, actually I'm gonna use the tip. This isn't open. I'm gonna use that rounded edge to kind of work out my corners. I didn't quite trim enough, I don't think there, but you get the gist of it. You can make yours even prettier. Okay, so now that I've got it turned, I'm gonna take it to the iron and give it a quick press so that it flattens out. Same as when we were doing the top of the Santa hat, I want to get that turned so that the seam is right on the rim there. Now, Colleen, I am saving a couple tool questions for the end of the okay. project, but we've got a couple right about this strip that you're working on. Um, okay. I'm going to get Twyla's in here. Twyla is curious if it wouldn't be easier to create a strip set and then cut them to length. What do you think about that? You could. Um, the reason why I did it is I had a variety and I didn't want to have my fabrics, the, the different prints to land in the same spot. I wanted it to be more scrappy, but strip set definitely would work. And that would be a quicker approach. 
<laughs> All right. And Nancy's got a final question about this particular step. Uh, Nancy wants to know if it's possible to just flip the rows instead of re-ironing them. You could. And again, it just happens to be if you have, depending how scrappy you want your little prints to be there. Um, if it doesn't bother you that two prints are similar next to each other, I really have a hard time doing scrappy. <laughs> In fact, I remember one time I was working on a scrappy project and I was having a really hard time. And my daughter, who was, I think, in middle school at the time, came and started just handing me two pieces so that whatever she handed me, I had to sew. And that forced me to be scrappy. So I, I do more plant scrappy than random scrappy, I guess. Okay, once you get this pressed nice and neat, remember that little piece of interfacing that I had you get? We just need a little piece of that iron on your facing because that is going to go over our hole. It's going to be the band-aid that holds the layer together here. So following the manufacturer's instructions on the heat, the setting for your iron and how long to heat interfacing, make sure you read those because sometimes they vary. We don't want to have a mess on the back of our iron. We just want to adhere that over the hole so that it holds those fabrics trimmed to the back. Now, the last step is to take, well, last couple steps, is to take this to the sewing machine and stitch all the way around a quarter inch in like we did on the hat portion. That gives kind of a trim and keeps those edges nice and neat there. So a simple stitch around that edge. This will be a quick one, make sure. Uh, we can set the stitch length again a little bit longer, at least a 3.0, so that it doesn't need to be a tiny, tiny stitch like we use in piecing, because we're just giving it kind of a, a little, kind of a little stylized edge there with a top stitch. It reminds me of all those years when I was garment sewing and we were, we would do a stitch around cuff or a collar point. And it always made your collar and your, and your cuffs look so much better. <laughs> okay. My corners on this one aren't perfect today. I'm sorry to say, but um, a little bit more time would probably have created a better curb. Okay. Once you get all the way around that edge, then it's time to apply it to your towel. And I thought about this one over and over, how to get, because we're getting into thick, thick layers here. And I don't want anybody texting and saying, oh, I broke a needle. <laughs> that would be sad because it's not fun to break a sewing machine needle on your sewing machine. So what I ended up doing is taking this hat band and centering it. So there's a little piece that will go off each end. So it's a little bit longer than the towel itself, kind of gives it a rounded feel. And the bottom portion is going to be down on the towel, just barely, so that we don't have to sew through all these thicknesses. We're just going to be going through the towel here. And at the top, we're just going to be stitching along here. Remember that tool? What's my favorite tool? Glow stick <laughs> to hold it in place. I don't want to get poked by pins. Bonnie does want to know what kind of glue stick that is that is your favorite tool. This is a Fonz and Porter glue stick, but Sewline makes one. I think the holder on it is the outside is pink. So if you're a pink person, um, Quilter Select also makes one. I think it's turquoise on the outside. So there are at least three different brands of glue stick that are all very similar in, um, in the way they work. They're all machine washable. Okay, once you get this positioned, then all we do is totally cheat. We are going to stitch right over that outline that we just did on the hat band so that no one really notices we're doing two lines of stitching there. So trying to see the stitching underneath there, line it up. At first, you're gonna do a reinforced stitch because this is gonna hold it in place. So at the beginning, reinforced stitch, then stitch across the towel right on top of your previous stitching. And I thought about, it's like on the back side, you're gonna see white thread, but if I put red bobbin in there, I can't guarantee that my, my, because of the layers and thickness that my tension will be perfect. So 
So we're gonna have a little bit of white thread in the back, that's okay. Then reinforce, and when you get to the far side, break thread, and then we're going to do that again on the lower portion of the hat band. We're gonna line it up, do a reinforced stitch and stitch across the project. And this is, oh, I broke thread. <laughs> That's what happens. You got any questions while I rethread my sewing machine? Uh, oh my goodness. Yes, we can get to a few questions. First of all, okay. a couple comments. So Anna and Bonnie and Colleen, I have to confess myself as well. Uh, there's a lot of love out there for the jacket that you're wearing. It looks cozy and festive and fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, when I went to get dressed for this program, I'm like, oh, it's St. Nicholas Day. How oh, perfect. I can look like Mrs. Claus. And I have the hair to even go with it. <laughs> Don't tell my grandkids, though, because they'll start calling me that. <laughs> oh, we'll keep it our little secret, just us and all of the okay. viewers. <laughs> yes. Only a few thousand individuals. That's all. Exactly. Well, Daisy and Cora don't start it. I'll be fine. <laughs> okay. Now that my thread is back intact. Sometimes a slow stitch through thick layers is better so your thread doesn't snap. Our machines are, are heavy duty. They can take just about anything, but sometimes going a little too fast is not a good thing. Reinforce stitch as you get to the far end. Okay, now trimming threads is going to be, of course, important to get it all cleaned up. And then we can take a look at how it's where we're at here. All we have left is the closure at the very top. For a while there today, I didn't know if we'd ever get this project together. Okay, so now it's stitched at the top, it's stitched at the bottom. Yes, there's a little opening on each side, but no one's ever going to see that. All we have left is to fold this down and to do our button. So if you are a sewist and you know how to make so buttons on your sewing machine, make a buttonhole. Always make a practice buttonhole first. I remember that from my sewing days. Make sure that your buttonhole will be sufficient for your button to slide through. So you'll want to practice the buttonhole, make sure it's the right size, and then mark the start and the end of your buttonhole. Do a buttonhole here, attach your button, and you're done. If you decide that buttonholes are not your thing, here's the cheat. You take a piece of hook and loop tape, this happens to be the two-sided version. I love this because you never run out of either side because one side is hook and one side is loop all on the same piece. It's fabulous. So you attach one piece here, one piece here, making sure you get it aligned properly. Stitch this down with matching red thread if you're working on red so that as you're working through here that you won't see the stitching and once your hook and loop tape is in place, then go back and stitch the button right on top so that no one has to know there really isn't a buttonhole underneath there. And then the hook and loop tape will be your closure. So that puts together Christmas cheer and you are ready to get to that Christmas baking and um, all those holiday entertainment things. So your kitchen will be cheerful and happy and ready for baking. We have any other questions out there, Leah? We do have a few. So first I'm going to share just a couple comments here. So Kimberly was mentioning that with older machines, anybody that's out there like she has, uh, a walking foot can help sew through all the thickness. So that was something that she wanted to comment Ooh, on. That does help. And then Maddie's mom <laughs> says you could use a white towel and say it's Santa's beard. What do you think about that? Oh, that would be adorable. Um, yeah, it could be a white beard. And if you put the, a, a nose here, it could be a gnome Santa. Oh. <laughs> See, there are so many variations. Once you start working on something, the ideas start to flow and you can have so much fun. Except that in my kitchen, I'm not sure white towels survive very long. My husband likes to cook. And as a former army cook, he didn't do the cleanup. Someone else did. So the white towel would be toast in no time. <laughs> so I'm sticking with red. <laughs> but you you can try that. That sounds really great. Uh, okay. and, share, and share photos, of course. Um, yes, our next please. question, Colleen, goes way, way back to the very beginning when you okay. were talking about the pattern and the tools that you use. So Evelyn wants to know, what is the plastic when you were talking about plastic for the pattern? 
What do you use? Can you show that to us again and kind of talk about that? Template plastic is something that you can find in your local quilt shop. You can find sheets online. They're really inexpensive. It's kind of a frosted on one side. It's fairly smooth. The other side is a little bit more textured. Um, it, there are a lot of substitutes that people have used over the years. Uh, when our great grandmothers were quilting, they probably used the uh, recycled butter tub lid because it was plastic and they could cut around the shape. But in order to have something large enough to create these shapes, the template plastic is really inexpensive and a great way to kind of preserve those shapes if you want to use them again. So these come as I'm trying to remember how big these sheets are. They are, let me measure really quick. They are like. 12 or 13 by 15, I think, or so. They come in large sheets and they do come smaller also. So you can, you know, Google template plastic or quilters template plastic, and you can find those, um, you can find it online or at your local quilt shop. All right. Well, Colleen, I don't see any other questions. So I'm going to let you have the floor for a moment with any final thoughts. And if anyone has any last minute questions, now's the time to drop them in before we have to say farewell. So Colleen, talk us through this one last time. Any final thoughts that you have? Okay. Quilters, our Christmas cheer, the little towel that we made today is kind of an inspiration because Christmas to me means family getting together, loads and loads of baking and lots of sweet things. So as we prepare and we're getting our homes ready and decorating, sometimes adding that just that little bit of touch to the kitchen can be um, a reminder of those days of cooking in the past. And then keep that tradition going into the future with grandkids, with neighbors, share those goodies. Don't keep them all for yourself. <laughs> prepare those plates. Take a plate to your hairdresser, take a plate to the neighbor, um, somebody at church. So as you're in the kitchen, you, get, you need to have that festive cheer too. So Christmas cheer towel, you can use a towel and mix two because you split it and have to make the bottom. A little bit of red fabric, probably maybe even some leftovers from a, a previous project would be enough. And some leftover scraps of white on white to make a Christmas um, Santa hat band and a large button and you will have your kitchen looking like it's time for Santa's workshop to start your baking. All right, well, with that said, I also wanna just remind everybody watching, you can check out the chat box for a little bit of crowdsourcing too. So some of our viewers have been sharing little tips and things on where to find some of these tools and things that they like. So that's always in the chat box as well. If you haven't visited it yet, go ahead and take a look. There's just a little bit of community sharing happening. And then I have a couple reminders before I let you go for today. So first, we mentioned it already, but we would love for you to share your projects with us. So if you are making any of the projects today or any from this mini series, please use the hashtag share craftsy. That way we can see everything that the community is doing. And it's so fun to see the little spins that you put on your projects, like the white Santa's beard. And then of course, that means we've got more of these. So tomorrow we will continue our cozy craft along mini series and we'll be streaming live with our master pastry chef, Colette Christian. We'll start that at 2 p.m. Central time and you'll be getting a live demo from Colette on how to bake the cranberry cream cheese danish so bring your appetite but also download your free recipe right now using the link in the description before tomorrow's event you can find the entire mini series schedule in the video description as well so until we see you tomorrow on behalf of colleen and the entire team my name is leah happy 